Ah, Dr. Atkinson having a nice day fishing. Now, most aquatic life requires oxygen to be dissolved in the water in order for it to survive. But there are some situations where that oxygen level can be depleted. What a beautiful outlook. So raw sewage, uh, when it goes into water, will become oxidized uh, and thus removing oxygen from the water itself. Nitrate fertilizers will also encourage the growth of algae, which will reduce oxygen levels as will phosphates that are used in many detergents for cleaning clothes. Algae and other organisms will digest the phosphates, use up the oxygen, die and deplete oxygen levels even further. Thus, killing fish who will suffocate as the algal blooms increase, die, sink and use up more oxygen as they decay. Well, that's unexpected. This is water from the East River of New York. So I'm going to put it into this container. Now you need to have a known volume of water. Now this is a 250 milliliter volumetric flask, but I'm actually going to fill it up completely. It's going to be slightly more than 250. And I'm going to have to work that out later. I don't want to leave any air in the flask because of course, then I'll be measuring the oxygen from the air and the water. I just want to measure it from the water. So I'm absolutely going to fill this up, even overfill it. Let me take the temperature. A chilly eight degrees. Okay, now I've knocked a bit of the water out. Okay, grab some manganese sulfate monohydrate. This supplies the manganese two ions. I've worked out you don't need much. Oh, you need some though. There we go, smashing. About that much. You put that in. And strangely enough, one of these pillows, an alkaline iodide azide pillow. So this supplies iodide and increases the pH because we need those hydroxide ions. Cut that off, goggles on, okay, a bit of a second too late. Let's try and pour that in as well. That looks weird. Cork it up, making sure there's no air bubbles. And shake it, baby. Now, if it turns brown, that means there is some dissolved oxygen. And indeed, it is turning brown. It's quite hard to shake it because of there's no air pocket to shake the liquid into. The brown is the manganese 2 turning to manganese 4. Set it down and you've got to let the precipitate settle out about halfway. And once the, uh, the flocculant or the precipitate has settled out about halfway, shake it up again. And then wait again for the flocculant to settle about halfway. Okay, so still no air bubbles. Seems quite good. We had the manganese four ions here, which is kind of the brown manky color. Now I have to reduce the pH for the next part to work. Carefully remove the stopper. And I'm going to add two milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid. Move back a bit in case I spill it. just under two. So this is an excess, doesn't have to be exact. Alrighty, and you can see the reaction taking place here. 
The new brown colour is iodine molecules being formed all the way through. And the kind of cloudy manganese 4 has turned into manganese 2. Okay, now transfer your solution because we can't really do a titration. Oh, and you know what? It's pretty stable, but you don't want to aerate it any more than you have to. Although the, uh, the number shouldn't change because these chemicals you've added has stabilized the oxygen level. And no reason to tempt fate. All right, now we're gonna do a titration. This is sodium thiosulfate. Now, if I wasn't so brave, I'd split this sample in two to give me two tries at doing it. But let's see if I can titrate first time. Sodium thiosulfate is going to turn the brown I2 iodine molecules into colorless iodide molecules. The transition from brown to not brown isn't as obvious as you'd like. So when I get close to the end, I'm going to add a little starch and that's going to sharpen the end point. Add a little starch, non-toxic, literally a pinch. Literally two pinches. Okay, so the end point is now sharpened. It's hopefully going to be one drop, changes everything. Now that might be the end, I can't tell, so I'm going to take a reading. It's exactly uh, 1.95 millilitres, so I'm not sure if that's the end. So I'm going to remember 1.95 millilitres, oh, you probably should write it down if you're doing the experiment. Now let's carry on and see if this is indeed the end. Seems to be getting more colourless. Let's see if that's the end. I'm writing down in my brain 2.7 millilitres. 2.7 millilitres. Ah, you know what? It wasn't an instantaneous reaction. I think we're pretty much done at 2.7. So I need to know the total volume of this. I know it says 250, but it's only 250 up to that line. There's a little bit more. So... Put it down to measure the meniscus, like we're taught to in high school. <laughs> 262 millilitres in total, this was. Okay, so these are the three equations. You won't be asked to remember them, but you'll be asked to use them. So if I know the concentration of the sodium thiosulfate, and I know the volume of sodium thiosulfate I've used in my burette, I know the moles. If I know the moles, I can work out the moles of iodine, which is the same as the moles of iodine there. And if I know the moles of iodine there, I can work out the moles of manganese 4 oxide, which will be the same as the moles of manganese 4 oxide there. And once I know that, I can use that to work out the dissolved oxygen content. Now, if I know the moles of dissolved oxygen, and I know the volume of water that I used, I can work out the concentration. And so that's a, a broad overview of the theory. So here's a question that you could be asked based on the data that I collected from that little experiment I attempted. So just to recap, if I know the moles of that, I can work out the moles of that, to that, to that, to that, to dissolved oxygen. Okay, so the moles of fire sulfate, first of all, just tidy it up a bit. So looking at the solution of sodium thiosulfate that was in the burette, let me work out the concentration of that. So that's moles over volume, and moles is mass over molar mass. So putting in the numbers, 
molar mass from the bottle and the volume in decimeters cubed. That means the concentration of sodium thiosulfate in my burette is that. Now I'm using one more sig fig than I need. There's two sig figs in the 2.7, so I'm going to save three sig figs and then work it all out later. Okay, now I know the concentration of sodium thiosulfate in the burette, and I know the volume, I can work out the moles. So concentration is moles over volume, which gives me moles is concentration times volume. Concentration, I just worked it out. And the volume, well, don't forget to convert to decimeters cubed by dividing by a thousand. Okay, that's how many moles of fire sulfate I have. So that's the moles of fire sulfate. And since the ratio is one to two, I must have half of that moles of iodine. That number now moves up to the middle equation. And I wanted to know about the manganese four oxide. It's a one to one ratio. It's the same number of moles. Move that number up. Don't double it. It's tempting to double it, but just leave it as it is. Now the oxygen is going to be half the number of moles. Again, looking at the ratio. Smash it. So that's the moles of oxygen dissolved in the water. There are three ways to measure concentration, so let's do all three. So concentration in moles per decimeters cubed. Well, I just worked out the moles, and the volume of water was 263 milliliters, converted to decimeters cubed. So that's the concentration in moles per decimeters cubed. Two sig figs. If I want to measure it in grams per decimeters cubed, Concentration is going to be mass of the solute over the volume, the solution. Now to work out the mass from the moles, you have to multiply by the molar mass of oxygen, which is 32 grams per mole, divided by the volume in decimeters cubed. And so my concentration is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 3 grams per decimeters cubed. And then the question it asked in parts per million. So that's the mass of the constituent, in this case, oxygen. Divided by the mass of everything you've got times by a million. So the mass of the constituent, the oxygen, well, I know the moles from my calculation before, multiplied by the molar mass, gives me the mass of oxygen. And what's the mass of 263 milliliters? Well, I'm gonna assume it's 263 grams. One milliliter of water is almost exactly one gram. It's not pure water, of course. Times by a million to give me 4.8 parts per million. So what about biological oxygen demand then? Well, get your sample of water, which probably has some pollution and some bacteria and organisms in it. Saturate it with oxygen, bubble oxygen through it until it will take no more oxygen. Then close the lid. And what's gonna happen is the organisms are gonna digest their food and use the oxygen up, bit by bit, just like that. And the pollution is going to be food, if you will, for the organisms. So they're going to proliferate even more. Now you need to wait five days for this to happen before you do your BOD test, which is the Winkler test. One, two, three, four, 